All right, all right, and all righty. Welcome back to another edition of Politics Alive with Neil. Today we're going to talk about Tucker Carlson, uh, some more leaked text, but uh, we're going to talk about something that's a little more interesting than, oh my God, Tucker said this aspect of it, and that is how unlikely bedfellows, the New York Times, far, far, far left newspaper, is partnering up, can you say, with uh, sort of moderate news channel Fox News to try to smear Tucker. But the uh, interesting part, uh, and I'll explain why uh, in a moment, is that it's their attempt, and these are major media players, has been a colossal failure. Let's take a look. So the New York Times and Fox News uh, did a hit piece on Tucker Carlson over offensive texts, uh, and it backfires spectacularly. So Fox News and the New York Times just launched a coordinated attack on Tucker Carlson, but their mission fell flat on its face. In fact, the attempt to smear him only ended up showing the world what a genuine and thoughtful human being Tucker Carlson really is. The hit job on Tucker centered around private text mess- or a private text message he sent to his producer, which later became part of the Dominion Fox lawsuit. In the message, Tucker shared a human observation he made about himself and the current political division in America while watching a violent altercation between Trump supporters and an Antifa guy on TV. It was an insightful moment that revealed a level of self-awareness that is rare in many people these days. Unfortunately, in our politically correct Marxist society, observing reality has become a taboo, especially if it goes against the left's narrative. Now, Tucker eventually felt pity for the Antifa guy who was getting pummeled by the Trump supporters. Uh, I hear somebody tweeting about it, uh, and I'll, t- I'll get to the text, and you know, I'll get to the conversation that Tucker had in a second, but here's a reaction uh, from Greg Price. Wow, I literally cannot believe that Tucker Carlson squints saw the humanity in an Antifa guy getting beaten up. Uh, So here's a close-up of the actual message from Tucker. Uh, This is Tucker's text to a producer. Uh, Tucker Carlson from January 7th, 2021. Uh, Once again, this is Tucker. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching video of people fighting on the street in Washington. A group of Trump guys surrounded an Antifa kid and started pounding the living S out of him. It was three against one at least. Jumping a guy like that is dishonorable, obviously. It's not how white men fight. Yet suddenly, I found myself rooting for the mob against the man, hoping they'd hit him harder and kill him. I really wanted them to hurt the kid. I could taste it. Then... Somewhere deep in my brain, an alarm went off. This isn't good for me. I'm becoming something I don't want to be. The Antifa creep is a human being. Much as I despise what he says and does, much as I'm sure I'd hate him personally if I knew him, I shouldn't gloat over his suffering. I should be bothered by it. I should remember that somewhere, somebody probably loves this kid and would be crushed if he was killed. If I don't care about those things, if I reduce people to their politics, how am I better than he is? So it's hard, and so that's Tucker. Uh, Having said that, it's hard to blame Tucker for being angry with Antifa after they terrorized his wife in their home in D.C. in 2018. Just take a look at this for a few seconds. So that was in the middle of the night. A, a, a group of Antifas went to Tucker Carlson's private house. He was not home. His wife and children were there. Uh, they were chanting, uh, we know where you sleep at night, uh, and banging and you know, disturbing them. Apparently, they, they knocked on the door. Uh, the, you know, the wife did not know what was going to happen. This was in the around the same time that BLM uh, was having riots where they were murdering people. Uh, you know, so the wife was scared to death in the home with a gun, you know, just on the other side of the door, 
hoping that they didn't break in. So um, the Tucker's hardly not justified to be upset. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to the story. While some may consider Tucker's observation about quote-unquote white men fighting to be politically incorrect, uh, the author of this piece says he's actually right. Uh, once again, this is the author's piece, but uh, I'll let you guys decide for yourself what you think about it. Uh, the author says there are stark differences between how black and white people fight, as we've seen in countless videos, and there's nothing racist about it to point it out. Uh, and here's a little bit of a video he has. Are these things happening in very public places, also some of them happening in broad daylight, and some business owners around here are fed up. New video shows the disturbing attack in downtown Crossing. A 20-year-old woman beaten and kicked by a group of juveniles while she's already down, one of them as young as 12 years old. That was baffling, honestly. It was incredible to see that because I've never seen any type of thing like that in my life ever. So anyway, you get the point. I don't, once again, I don't necessarily agree that people necessarily fight differently based on their race, but I do think people fight differently based on their culture. And I think uh, it's too broad a brush to say white and black people, but I, I sort of get the point, you know, and also it's a private message. Has anyone ever said anything inappropriate in a private message? Um, you yeah. know, so anyway, Tucker said that. The author goes on. Uh, to say, hey, if you don't believe me on this issue, just spend a few minutes on the World Star Hip Hop website. Uh, I'm not going to play that, but you can go there at your own risk. Uh, what Tucker did next was to expose the left as a hate-filled bully mob that lacks the courage for change. In a country that now rewards conformity and groupthink, Tucker's self-awareness and observations are seen as a threat. This tweet from the New York Times shows the world how Fox News executives can't handle the truth and overreact like a bunch of hysterical, screeching schoolgirls. Uh, this is from the New York Times. Breaking news, a text message sent by Tucker Carlson that set off a panic at Fox showed him sharing his private inflammatory views about violence and race. Are we seriously to believe Rupert, Rupert Murdoch needed his smelling salts after reading Tucker's text message. Uh, Christian Cannon tweets, Good point. The Murdoch family are such upstanding people that they would be shocked, shocked, I tell you, to see those text messages. I heard when he read them, Rupert fainted on his couch. Obviously, uh, the article goes on to say, the public is on Tucker's side in this fight. Robbie Starbuck tweets, how dare he be factually accurate and empathetic towards someone he hates. Uh, and then someone else uh, tweets, having this humanity should be seen as a good thing. Uh, so anyway, it's also interesting to see how the New York Times framed Tucker's tweet in their story. So rather than acknowledging the thoughtful message Tucker shared, they instead chose to use the phrase inflammatory views on race and violence. It just goes to show how the media can twist the story to fit their narrative, even if it means disregarding the true message behind it. Exactly. It's all about context. They're, they're so obsessed on trying to catch someone on words that it's actually quite a nice message he's saying you know he's seeing the humanity in his enemy uh, so the new york times frame job on this tweet is so hysterical and pathetic you'll get a laugh out of reading it firsthand so this is a little excerpt from the new york times article a text message sent by tucker carlson that set off a panic at the highest levels of fox on the eve of its billion dollar defamation trial showed its most popular host sharing his private inflammatory views about violence and race. For years, Mr. Carlson espoused his views or espoused views on his show that amplified the ideology of white nationalism. But the text message revealed more about his views on racial superiority. 
The text alarmed the Fox board, which saw the message a day before Fox was set to defend itself against Dominion voting systems before a jury. The board grew concerned that the message could become public at a trial when Mr. Carlson was on the stand, creating a sensational and damaging moment that would raise broader questions about the company. The day after the discovery, the board told Fox executives it was bringing in an outside law firm to conduct an investigation into Mr. Carlson's conduct. A law firm to look into a tweet? Okay. Uh, So Tucker is apparently guilty of offending the many strong feminist, independent, and empowered women employed by Fox, too. Uh, So the New York Times article goes on to say, the text message added to a growing number of internal issues involving Mr. Carlson that led to the company leadership, concluding he was more of a problem than an asset and had to go, according to several people with knowledge of the decision. So a little bit of a sidebar. Anytime you see in a mainstream media article the phrase, according to several people with knowledge of the decision or knowledge of the situation, uh, then you know it's a lie. But going on. Uh, In other messages, Tucker had referred to women, including a senior Fox executive, in crude and misogynistic terms. Uh, Just so you know, he referred to some executive he didn't like as a see you next Tuesday. Oh, no, a grown man said a bad word. uh, You know, which is similar to uh, the left going apoplectic uh, when Donald Trump said the P-U-S-S-Y word once. Oh, no, 11, you know, at this point, you know, 11 years before the campaign, he said a bad word. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the article back to the New York Times, the message about the fight also played a role in the company's decision to settle with Dominion for $787.5 million, the highest known payout in a defamation case. And the New York Times concludes its piece with a supposed parade of horribles to convince you that Tucker Carlson is a very, very, very naughty boy. A recurring theme of his show during the six years that it ran in prime time on Fox News was the displacement of white Americans by people of color. Mr. Carlson often, often framed topics in the news as part of a larger struggle between us and them, with immigrants and other marginalized groups steadily and surely taking from whites what had long been theirs, political and cultural power in the United States. Uh, I watch Tucker all the time, by the way. Uh, I've never heard him attack uh, immigrants simply for being immigrants. He's ultimately pro-immigrant. He's just against illegal immigration, uh, and he's saying that we should have control over who and how many immigrants come in. It's hardly an extremist position. Uh, The article goes on to say he attacked, Tucker attacked, black social justice activists and portrayed immigrants from Central America as a blight on the nation. He said in 2018 that immigrants make the country dirtier. In the aftermath of mass shootings in El Paso at the hands of a gunman who cited white supremacist beliefs in his manifesto, Mr. Carlson declared on his show that white supremacy was not a real problem, liking it to a conspiracy theory. Uh, By the way, speaking of white supremacy, I've made it over five decades on this planet. I've never met a white supremacist. I know that they probably, you know, that they do exist somewhere, somehow. <clears throat> but, you know, and, and I can't prove how many there are or there aren't, but I've always said, if you were to have a meeting of every white supremacist in America, you could probably have it in a phone booth. Uh, anyway, the article goes on to say, on Monday, the New York Times and other news organizations urged the judge overseeing the Dominion case to release some of the messages, messages that were redacted. So uh, anyway, yeah, painfully obvious to most that Fox News was the one who leaked the text to the New York Times. Twitter pundit Greg Price had this to say about the leak. Uh, the real story here is that someone is leaking text messages from court documents that are currently under seal, and the New York Times is reporting it as if Fox found them the night before the Dominion trial. But as I reported on my Substack, a source directly familiar with the Dominion litigation told me that it's impossible because Fox and their lawyers would have been in charge of producing communications before Tucker went in for his deposition last year. So the real story here is that someone, someone, 
uh, Fox News uh, is trying to smear their host, uh, and they're leaking it to the New York Times, is my guess. So the real story here is that someone is leaking text messages from court documents that are currently under seal and that the New York and that the New York Times is reporting it as if Fox found them the night before the Dominion trial. Uh, you can you can read Greg Price's Substack. I'm not going to link to it now. Uh, besides the the fact that this text makes Tucker look good, not bad. Someone else on Twitter made a great point. If this is how Fox News treats its employees once they leave, why would anyone want to leave? Uh, why would anyone want to work there? Uh, and Cindy on Twitter says, I don't know how anyone can continue to work there knowing that this is what they do to you when you leave. They can't have much on him if this is all they can dig up. So shenanigans like that is why the network is now in a state of chaos, chaos, paranoia, and ter- turmoil. And I would add... It's also why their ratings overall for the whole network are down, uh, you know, 30%. I think it's 29.6%. But, uh, and then they're down even more in Tucker's time slot. But they've lost a third of their viewers over this. So the bottom line is that Tucker's text message was both reasonable and rational. And it's hard to imagine any normal thinking person finding it offensive. It's also, sad, it's also a sad reflection on the castrated fools over at Fox News and shows easily panic they are by the truth. Is this really how one of the nation's top news organizations should behave with when it's faced with reality? So anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the recap on everything over at Fox. Uh, you know, once again, it has, uh, I think, this backfired. I'd love to get your thoughts. You know, so did the New York Times and Fox News did their hit piece on Tucker Carlson over, you know, overly offensive text backfire spectacularly? And did they wind up making? You know, did their reporting on this? Did their breaking news on this uh, make Tucker not only a sympathetic character but more likable? Let me know your comments. You know, let me know your thoughts um, in the comments, and uh, yeah, we'll pick this up uh, next week with the next bit of it. All right, so moving on, uh, you know, while we're talking about Fox, uh, yeah, so yeah, while we're talking about Fox, here's a, here's something, you know, I'll just start with, I'll just start playing it. This is uh, Greg Gutfeld, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so this is, I'm just trying to give credit where to do. So this is Robbie Starbuck uh, posting Greg Gutfeld, uh, the, the power off. So this is uh, Robbie Starbuck posting or reposting uh, Greg Gutfeld. He said, Democrats are going to get innocent people killed because of the way they viciously attacked the Marine who killed Jordan Neely. So Jordan Neely was like a violent homeless guy who had been arrested many times. Uh, He he got arrested for punching a 65-year-old lady in the face. Uh, I just recently heard, although I haven't verified it, that he also was arrested and served jail time for attempting to kidnap a 7-year-old girl. According to um, Ian Michael Chung, uh, he, you know he has forty violent arrests. Uh, so this guy gets on a subway train, starts threatening people, saying he doesn't, not afraid if he's going to die, and, and yeah, just threatening the other passengers. So somebody just subdues him, and either just by freak accident or you know drug overdose, who knows? Uh, for some reason, this guy dies, uh, which is his, you know this guy Jordan Neely dies, and. Uh, so yeah, so once again, that's sad, obviously, but basically, a good Samaritan just tried to protect the people around him, and, and this is even more important because the city will not do anything about homeless. The police kind of had their hand ties. Anytime they arrest someone, they just uh, get released without bail. Uh, the district attorney Alvin Bragg is too busy going after Donald Trump, so he doesn't care about crime. Uh, everything is out of control in the Democrat-run city of New York. Uh, it's absolute chaos. It is closer to uh, escape from New York than it is to New York as it were, was under the Giuliani or even Bloomberg administrations. So it's crazy. So people just have no choice but uh, to try to do something, you know, on their own. And now this poor guy, this uh, Marine that just tried to help, is uh, possibly facing manslaughter charges 
Uh, he's been doxxed. We'll get into that mo- in a moment. But let's just hear what Greg Gutfeld had to say about it on uh, Fox News. Be listened to. Um, Hochul said, you know, that could be you. Assuming that we, society, would identify with an unhinged, violent felon threatening people who've attacked women and children. That could be you. No, no, no. When you say that could be you, Governor, you should be talking about the bystanders who are now the target of losers like you, Hochul. That could be you. You could be the bystander on the train who decided to share the risk and do something to save somebody else, and you could be the target. That could be you. That's the story, you moron. This is how it works, right? The left hamstrings the police, and it creates a vacuum where security used to be. And then when it gets really, really bad, the Bernie gets moment, the citizens step in, and then they become the target. You saw that with Rittenhouse and the McCloskeys. The goal is to make that vacuum permanent. So this revolution through chaos, burn it all down, is endless, no matter what happens, right? Right? Obama got elected, burn it all down, right? The police improve, they start training, they start doing better things, you have a majority-minority force, burn it all down. Doesn't matter. In, in, in the minds of the radical left, it's always going to be burn it on down. Now we're seeing more video of the deceased, right, accosting people using homophobic language. F, the F word, that F word, the N word, right? It's strange, this beloved street performer, this beloved Michael Jackson performer is a relentless menace, and the media did not want to tell you he was a relentless menace, and it was only going to happen this way. This was not the beginning of the story. This was the end of the story. The city had this problem for years. This show, a few others were the canary in the coal mine. It wasn't The View. It wasn't AOC. Hochul, Hochul scoffed when we brought up the crime stuff during the election. Remember, she said it was played up. And now she's sitting there acting like she's compassionate. Shut up. It's her incompetence, her inaction that created this moment in time where young men, young men stepped up and did the job she was too cowardly to manage or do. All right. Thank you. Well said. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was Greg Gutfeld uh, saying it better than I ever could. Uh, so, yeah, let's just talk about, uh, uh, yeah, let, let me not uh, spoil that. So uh, now there's BLM and other, uh, BLM's a racist hate group that goes around. Uh, actually, I will say this. BLM does have some well-attentioned people that participate with it, but at its core, it's a Marxist group. It's a hate group. Uh, it blames police. Uh, it only cares about murders of black people when it's those rare instances, when it's a white person that does it. Um, and why do I say it's rare? I mean, let's just look at the actual FBI statistics. Now, FBI statistics are always a few years behind. So this is from uh, 2018, but uh, I would imagine you know, with the, the recent spikes in crime, it's gotten worse. But, uh, but this will just give you a good sense. So here are some numbers. Uh, you know, it's under the highlight perspective is everything. So this is interracial violent crime incidents, 2018. So black on white, so that's black attacking whites, committing crimes against whites is uh, 547, 900 and, or 948. So about 550,000 black on white uh, crimes, uh, which also is crazy that it's more than anything else because blacks are only... Uh, I think 12% of the population and whites are about 60, 60, 65. So anyway, so there's about 550,000 black on white crimes, uh, black on Hispanic crimes. There's, you know, 112,000 white on black crimes is 59. So basic 60,000. So just a fraction of the white on black crimes. Uh, white on Hispanic crimes, uh, for whatever reason, it's a little higher. It's 200,000. Uh, Hispanic on white, still much higher. Many more Hispanics committing crimes against whites, uh, 365,000. And Hispanic on black is the lowest, is uh, 44,000. Uh, by the way, I noticed they didn't put Asians in here, but I know this from past uh, you know, data, uh, the, the, the odds of it's just so low, you know, I mean, to their credit, Asians are not attacking that many other races, but they are getting attacked by other races. Uh, I know, once again, I don't have the thing in front of me, but you can research it. 
Asians are 231 times more likely to be assaulted by a black person than a black person is to be assaulted by a, an Asian. So, uh, so anyway, in this little infographic, it does have this here. It, it shows this is the media, and all they're focusing on is white on black crime. That's all they focus on. They're ignoring, uh, you know, black on white crime and you know all this Hispanic on white crime, and of course, of course, of course, they're also ignoring the highest of all the black on black crime. So uh, I, I just put this up there, and then let, somebody commented on this. Let's see. Oh, Elon Musk said, "Odd. Why would the media misrepresent the real situation to such?" an extreme degree. I don't know, what are your thoughts? Uh, why does the media misrepresent the real situation to such an extreme degree? Honestly, it is weird. Uh, you know, it, it's the, the question is rhetorical just to point out that they do it, but it almost doesn't make sense. The only possible answer I can come up with is that, it, is that they want to create racial uh, division, you know, division or angst uh, or problems between the races, but still, then you just go to well, why do they want to do that? I don't know, but that's what our media is doing. Uh, here's somebody, a, a popular Twitter guy named Chore, social activist, artist. Um, uh, here's what he had to say about this Jordan Neely. So this is this guy that got, um, you know, the guy that got, uh, you know, this guy, tried, this white guy uh, tried to restrain this guy that was uh, threatening people uh, you know, and was a violent criminal. And uh, this is what this guy Torre uh, had to say about it. So he tweeted, a homeless man yelling on the New York subway is normal. We see that all the time. He wasn't just yelling, but he was threatening. But nonetheless, a homeless man yelling on the New York City subways subway is normal. We see that all the time. What's not normal is for Marine to sneak up behind him and put him in a chokehold and unalive him. That's not justified. The Marine could have just done nothing. He should be charged. Uh, and by the way, he probably will be charged. Uh, already the, uh, you know, Alvin Bragg and uh, Holchel, the governor, Kathy Holchel of New York, and also some New York, you know, pretty big politicians like AOC are calling for him to be charged with murder. Uh, you know, or, or, you know, it, basically he shouldn't be charged with anything. It was self-defense and protecting others and also accidental, if anything, you know, that he died. Uh, or it could just be a drug over overdose. Who knows? So anyway, let's see what else Torre had to say. Uh, so this is a couple years ago. Uh, Torre in 2021, Tro Torre uh, tweeted about another case. A 77-year-old white customer at Dunkin' Donuts was upset about something, and he called a black 27-year-old employee the N-word. The brother told him to say it again, and the old man did. The brother knocked him out. The old man fell, lost consciousness, and died. He effed around and found out. And the Tory goes on to say, if there was actual justice in this country as opposed to white justice, then if you went to someone's minimum wage job and called them the N-word twice, whatever happened after that would be legally acceptable. The employee is facing a murder charge, which makes no damn sense. So, yes, yeah, so Tori's talking about this case uh, where a, you know, sort of out of it white guy, you know, 77-year-old guy called a black guy the N-word. Oh, no, a word. He said a word. Oh, no, how dare he say a word? But he said a, an impolite word. And then this black guy goes, oh, say that again. And then the old 77-year-old white guy, you know, to a 27, you know, 50 year age gap, said it to a 27 year old black guy, the N word, oh no, so bad, he said a naughty word. Uh, and then the black guy just punched him so hard, knocked him out and killed him. Uh, and then you know, Torre is saying, the employee is facing a murder charge, which makes no damn sense. Well, of course it makes sense. You can't kill someone because they said a word. Uh, and I'll just give you an update that went to trial and the black guy was acquitted. He literally killed someone because he said a word and he did not get charged. Yeah, he got away with it. So that's uh, uh, that's the world we live in. Uh, so here's a picture of the guy. Uh, and here's something I don't normally, I'm normally not critical, for all the woke military and all that stuff, I'm not normally critical of the military because anyone who served 
in the military, even in the leadership, which I'm not crazy about, uh, you know, they did something I haven't done. They signed up to serve our country. So even if they do it imperfectly, uh, which we'll also get to in a minute, you know, I, I, I always want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But this is disgusting. So here's the guy, uh, you know, Daniel J. Penny. That's the guy's name. Uh, named by the Marine Corps as the man involved in Monday's incident. So here's the guy. Uh, you know, that's the guy that died that was threatening him. This guy just tried to subdue him and stop him from hurting other people. But nobody knew who he was at first. And then the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps named him as, as one of their own. It, that is so gross, so gross. that This guy gave his, put his life on the line for our country and for the Corps. And that the Marine Corps would do that is disgusting. And I, I, I don't curse on this show, but F you, whatever piece of S in the Marines did that to one of their own brothers. You know, now this guy's life is in danger. So disgusting. So F you, not to the Marine Corps, but to whatever people in the Marine Corps did this disgusting stuff. F you. So end of rant against the uh you know, whoever in the Marine Corps did that. But it's just disgusting. It's it's a disgrace and it's a shame on the Corps. And once again, who am I to say that? I'm not a Corps member. Anyone who joined the Corps has done more than I have done. Uh, and I respect that and I honor that. But also, uh, on some level, that's just disgusting that you would do that. That the Marine Corps would, would, would you know, out this guy or be part of trying to dox this guy or anything like that gross disgusting uh go to hell all right so uh moving on moving on uh, but we're going to stick with the uh we're going to stick with the military theme for a moment yeah or two uh let's talk about uh this guy so this guy the u.s navy hires an active duty drag queen to be the face of the recruitment drive so once again i'm going to tread a thin line here this individual guy is a weirdo i think but he signed up to join the navy and then he did some stuff in his free time as a drag queen you know good for him you know that he's a grown man uh you know i think he's out as a gay guy you know drag is a hobby like burlesque you know it's fine if uh if he does that you know good for him you know or or maybe not you know Maybe not good, but not bad. You know, whatever the hell you want to do in your free time, that's fine. But here's where I think the the whole, you know, the, the military leadership went off. Someone has a hobby of, of being a, an effeminate drag queen, and you're the military whose job is to fight wars and kill people, you know, and also attract the right kind of people, then you shouldn't be using drag queens, in my opinion, to uh, push that message. But the Navy hired this, uh, and wait till you see this video. So the Navy hires an active duty drag queen to be the face of their recruitment drive. So the U.S. Navy invited an active duty drag queen to be a digital ambassador, uh, you know, similar to what Bud Light did, and we saw how that turned out, uh, to be an active duty, you know, to be a, a digital ambassador as part of a recent drive to attract the most talented and diverse workforce to combat plunging recruitment. So first of all, why would you want to attract the most diverse workforce? Who gives a f what, you know, whether the workforce is divorced, uh, divorced, uh, diverse? Uh, you know, once again, I'm not in the military, but I can tell you right now, uh, with any job, you know, it's not about diversity; it's about getting the best people for their job. And, and you know, and most most of the time, it's going to just wind up by the nature of the job. It's going to you're going to attract all kinds of people, uh, but some. Some uh, skill sets don't necessarily lead to uh, the best skill set for all jobs. So anyway, this guy, Joshua Kelly, who identifies as non-binary, binary, was appointed as the first of five Navy digital ambassadors in a pilot program that ran from October to March. Uh, Kelly, his, uh, whose stage name is Harpy Daniels, have shared their journey on TikTok and Instagram. So let's just take a look at Harpy's Instagram uh, here we go. So this is who the Navy chose as a digital ambassador. So once again, you know, good for him for, uh, you know, he can have a hobby, I guess. Well, who, care? who cares? But uh, let's look at his uh, announcement that he's a Navy digital ambassador. I'm 
All right, so that was uh, that was Harpy Daniels. Once again, I don't blame him. He's just some guy. He doesn't, you know, he's not in charge of the messaging for the Navy. Uh, but he was doing that at Navy, you know, at, I don't know if he was on ships, but he was doing it for sailors at Navy events. That's a little weird. I don't know why they're pushing that. But, you know, I mean, the Navy, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, I'll just say, uh, or somebody said, you know, I didn't think anyone could make the Navy gayer than it was but uh kudos to them and and once again not even that there's anything wrong with being gay but the navy is in charge of fighting battles and winning wars and i don't know how this sort of thing uh, helps them uh, but uh, poor old harpy daniel i'll just add this just closing out on harpy daniels uh he you know harpy you know he the u.s navy's drag queen ambassador accuses critics of not truly supporting the military. Uh, and once again, it's always that deal. Uh, I support the military, but, you know, is, is that going to recruit the best, you know, people, is that going to, quite honestly, people whose job it is to kill and win wars? Uh, and I would say no. Uh, so, yeah, what are your thoughts on Harpy Daniels and the Navy recruiting him as a digital ambassador. All right, so yeah, just moving on, moving on to the next uh, thing. Uh, and I guess this this relates to, uh, you know, one, I do support the military, and that, you know, as we just talked about, but also, um, you know, I I, uh, I always hesitate to to post this guy because he's he's a mixed bag, but. Uh, somebody described him as, you know, I- imperfect as his message may be. He's one of the few people, like, I don't know if I've met anyone, you know, not met, but uh, come across anyone online who actually does care about what's best for young men. You know, everywhere they go, I'm not a young man, but the message to young men is that, you know, that, that you're part of the problem, that, you know, uh, toxic masculinity is a problem, and that, you know, there's so much wrong with being a man and one of the few people actually speaking up saying anything for men is is this guy uh but this is a little not so much talking about being a young man but uh just sort of his ads uh, you know his attitudes on uh you know the, the whole transgender thing uh so yeah let's just give it a listen to andrew tate uh and tell me what you think against that i'm not anti-gay I'm not anti-transgender. I'm not anti any of these things. What I'm, what I am anti is propagating your worldview on other people's children. If you're gay and you can't have kids, why do you now believe it's your right to go to other people's kids and tell them how to think? If you've decided that the type of sex you want to have will prevent you from recreate, from procreating, that's your decision, right? You've decided that having sex with women isn't worth it for you. You don't want to have children. You want to have sex with men. Fine, your decision and you're entitled to it. That does not give you the entitlement to go to other people's families who did decide to have children and raise them and try and program their children. Leave the kids alone. You can be as transgender as you like. Don't come talk to my kid about it. That's my child. I will program my child with my worldviews. I raise them. I pay for them. They're my kid. They're not your kid. And they're not the government's kid. Leave the kids alone. All right. So that was Andrew Tate. Uh, I really have nothing else to add. But yeah, I think we can all agree. Uh, leave the kids alone. The whole problem with the transgender movement isn't that adult men are, are becoming drag queens. It's that adult men want to perform drag or indoctrinate children, you know, to do stuff for children. And that's just, like, who, like, who, who would ever want to do a sexualized drag, you know, any kind of sexualized dance in front of someone else's children? But that's what a lot of these drag shows are. So anyway, that's my, uh, Basically, on that issue, on most of that, I most of it, uh, I do agree with Andrew Tate. Uh, what are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments below. 